hospitals, no police. It's all gone. For real? What just happened? Tell him, Oscar. Stop talking, man. Oscar always stood up for him. He was my friend. He went out and fighting. <laughs> One time that summer. Welcome, everyone, to Dead Talk Live. I'm your host, Viz, from Walking Dead Now. And tonight, we are honored to have Lou Temple with us. Lou, thank you so much for agreeing to be on our show. How are you doing? I'm um, great, Viz. Man, thanks so much for having me. This is, uh, this is a real honor to be uh, on your show, and, and you do such a great job with it. And uh, I'm excited to be here. Well, we are excited to have you. Uh, I got to tell you, I don't really get nervous uh, before interviews. But a man with your credentials and your resume, uh, I got some knots in my stomach today. I got to tell you, I got to be honest. It is my honor to uh, for you to be here with us. And thank you so much for agreeing to spend some time with us tonight. Yeah, of uh, the- course, it'll be a good time. We'll make it, uh, we'll make it fun for, for us, and that'll make it fun for everyone. Absolutely, absolutely. And like I said, uh, Lou, your resume goes from movies TVs, even video games. Uh, yeah, I've done a few things. I've had some good fortune to, to get to spread it around a little bit. Uh, so I'm I'm always happy to be working, and I I don't take it for granted. I never do, and I I think that's a good way to approach life is to that's- just keep. Keep putting one foot in front of the other. Exactly. And that's why uh, I always end my show by say, stay walking. No matter how much life beats you down, you just got to keep on going. And Lou, that's good. before we even get started, I just wanted to bring something from, you know, your past. Uh, you were a baseball scout for yeah, my yeah. favorite team, the New York Mets, 1986. You were a scout for the New York Mets. Uh, when I read that, I was just uh, thrilled. Uh, I mean, is that accurate? Were you an actual active scout for the New York Mets? Yeah, I was working with uh, Joe McElvain mm-hmm. at the time. He was someone that I'd known for a long time, and he was really kind to me as a, as a player, a baseball guy, uh, as a minor league player. And so I was growing uh, my background mm-hmm. to be a front office executive and scouting is part of that where you're looking for players and of course that 86 team mm. uh that, it, it's a big team in a lot of new yorkers hearts that's that, that was that yeah. was i was uh 12 and that's when i became a mets fan and i've been i've been i've been waiting what is it now like uh what 30 some odd years for another championship but all right now with the baseball talk i mean you and i can talk baseball for hours i could guarantee yeah, no you that uh, who's your favorite met and then we'll go who's your favorite met player current we'll met go. right now no it's from your childhood keith hernandez daryl strawberry yeah those are good ones keith hernandez daryl strawberry i've met ron darling uh, several times. That, uh, Are you left-handed, Viz? No, seriously? no. I'm okay. I'm a righty. I'm a righty. But you'd like to be. You'd like to be a left. I'd love to be a left-hander. I mean, Daryl Strawberry uh, to me was an icon. <laughs> that whole team right there. It's just amazing. And you know what, Lou? I grew up literally less than two miles away from Shea Stadium. Oh, that's great! So you could you could walk over. Oh yeah, and catch yeah, me. yeah. It's oh, that's great. two train stops away. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> well, it's, that, that beats having to find parking over there. Oh God, me. tell me about it. The train is so awesome. So Lou, we have a lot of fan questions today. Uh, oh good. With you being here with us today, I did something different. I invited uh, some of our fans to video in their questions. So we have some video questions. We, That'll be fun. We have some text questions, and let's just dive right into it. So, your uh, acting career started uh, back in 1993. You were around a 25, 26 year old man at the time, and it was a TV miniseries short called Dragon Halfback. 
uh, Dragon have Dragon have sorry back in 1993. And then the Bye. following year, you were in a pretty big movie in Angels in the Outfield. So basically, it's a two part question that I have for you to get this started. A at what point in your life? Because we know baseball was a big part of your life. At what sure. point did you decide that acting was the way that you wanted to go? And B, what would you say was your biggest break? Well, uh, I didn't. I had always been someone that was rather gregarious and was kind of the life of the party. Definitely the class clown mm -hmm. growing up, and so I knew that I liked uh, entertaining and storytelling and listening to a good story. So I understood that was within me, and then uh, I followed someone into an acting class one afternoon in Houston to uh, to maybe get a date and I saw what was going on at on stage and it just bit me the acting bug and I uh, pursued that up in Brooklyn College as a matter of fact wow. um, with a uh, professor Stanley Zaroff and and found out how to do it so at that point in time I literally walked away from my baseball career of which I have no doubt I would have stayed in forever. Um, so I took a chance. I took a big risk and I, I bet on myself, which I would encourage everyone to do because more often than not, it will work out. But you have to believe in it. It's You have to give yourself that permission. Absolutely. And my big break came, <clears throat> interestingly enough, I was doing a lot of theater and I was um, not getting many opportunities in film or television. I wasn't the quintessential. I was quirky looking and a little off in in those days they they weren't so um they weren't going with the odd looks very much there was real middle america real uh kind of cookie cutter yeah and there was a director out of new york city named matt harrison who was who was directing a commercial and for the texas lottery and he cast me he thought i was interesting and he cast me and that gave me the confidence to recognize I could work in the film medium. I was going to be okay just doing stage. I, I really, not just doing stage, but doing stage. I really enjoy theater. But then I, I got the break doing this commercial. And then the next thing for me was Walker, Texas Ranger. Yes. Uh, in, um, in Dallas. And, and then my career started to, to get, gain some movement. So oh, yeah. I suppose it was a director that cast me in a commercial out of new york city wow and from there the rest of you that say is history right it keeps getting to be history oh yeah. my god i mean i had just kept, i went to your imdb page several times over the years and you just keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling your credit your credits are endless so let's move on to the next thing walk us through the events that led you to landing the role of axel on the walking dead oh Oh, Lou, are you there? I think... Oh, hold on. Sorry, guys, we lost Lou there. Let me try to get him back. Uh, sorry about that, guys. We lost his connection. I'm calling him right back. Lou? Yeah. Oh, are we there? Are yeah, we yeah. Sorry, we just got interrupted. Uh, I don't know what yeah. happened. Uh, that's what you got to love about these live things. Anything can happen. Uh, I apologize to the audience, but I'm back, and I'll try not to let that happen again. No, Getting back to no your question, which was uh, how I got started with The Walking Dead, as I said, um, I had known about the graphic novels because they came across my desk, and I thought they were really cool. Uh, but I never thought that they would be on television. They were so violent. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, there's no way they'll pull this off. And lo and behold, they went ahead and did it anyway. Mm -hmm. Who cares what Lou Temple thinks? Um, so I was asked to come in and read for the character of Merle wow. to begin with. Yeah. I did not and know so, that. And it, yeah, it was the scene up on the roof, the yeah. great monologue yeah. where he's, you know, he's, he's handcuffed to the roof. 
And uh, the casting office knew me from, from other work. And so they brought me in. Thank goodness they hired Michael Rooker, right? <laughs> so a few weeks later, I was invited to come in and read again for Merle's brother. But Merle's brother doesn't have a name yet. And he doesn't have any lines. And we haven't really built him. But we know we're going to have this guy in the show. Just read Merle's lines again as if it was his little brother. Do it different, the same. So I read for Daryl as it was at that time. Wow. And th thankfully, they hired Norman Reedus, right? I mean, we, we got a break. So by the time it came around to Axel, the, the Walking Dead production, the producers and writers and the casting office was very familiar with me, and I was on their radar. And they thought that would be a good fit. So they reached out to me. At the time, I was doing a film for Walt Disney called The Lone Ranger. Mm -hmm. and, we, and I was in the middle of filming that. And um, we started to get engaged with the conversation about potentially being Axel. And I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be done with this film by the time they're like, well, we can adjust schedule. And I had this huge mustache viz uh, uh, for Lone Ranger. And... I was concerned that I'm going to go film Walking Dead and they're going to shave the mustache and then I've got to go back to Lone Ranger. And so I was I was, I was, was asking them if they'd be okay with it. And they're like, oh yeah, we love the mustache. And I'm like, yeah, you say that now. I know how this goes. But thankfully they did love the mustache and, and they invited me to do Axel. I, I think that was a good fit I, for me. I, yeah. I can't imagine Axel without the mustache. <laughs> no, no. That's it, the Waxel. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, man. Well, like I said earlier, since your career uh, expands such a vast area of stuff, we're going to be bouncing back and forth. And like I told you before we got started, we have some video questions for you. Oh, and good. I want to play the first video question. It's actually from our executive producer, who's also my brother, and oh, it's nice. Marco. So I'm going to go ahead and play that question for you right now. Hey Lou, good evening. This is Marco Vizanyaris. I'm the executive producer of Dead Talk Live. I just want to thank you so much for being on our show. Look, I even wore a shirt and tie for you. But anyway, I'm a huge fan of yours and uh, a lot of our subscribers and fans are a huge fan of yours as well. So from the bottom of my heart and from Viz and everyone associated with Dead Talk Live, I want to thank you for taking your time as being our guest. Um, I just have a question for you, which I'm sure you're going to get questions from a lot of fans, but I know that you and Rob Zombie have a very good relationship, I'm assuming, since you worked prior together in such great movies as Halloween and Devil's uh, Rejects and 31. How does the audition process happen? Does he just call you up on a Sunday afternoon okay, when you're at home having a beer and saying, hey, Lou, I got a, I got a movie for Guys, sorry, when we got disconnected, I had to uh, reconnect Lou's screen because we had a screen sharing. So let me go ahead and share that with you, Lou. I apologize. I apologize. I should have said something before, but I realized, oh, why am I not seeing Marco? Yeah, but, yeah. Um, there we go. It's uh, We had it set up, and then we got disconnected. All right, guys. So you guys, uh, our audience gets to see Marco for a second time. So here we go. Do you see, sorry, my, guys. Do you see my screen now, Lou? Yeah, okay, I do. Here we go. Hey, Lou. Good evening. This is Marco Vizanyaris. I'm the executive producer of Dead Talk Live. I just want to thank you so much for being on our show. Look, I even wore a shirt and tie for you. But anyway, I'm a huge fan of yours and uh, a lot of our subscribers and fans are a huge fan of yours as well. So from the bottom of my heart and from Viz and everyone associated with Dead Talk Live, I want to thank you for taking your time as being of our guest. Um, I just have a question for you, which I'm sure you're going to get questions from a lot of fans, but I know that you and Rob Zombie have a very good relationship, I'm assuming, since you worked prior together in such great movies as Halloween and Devil's uh, Rejects and 31. How does the audition process happen? Does he just call you up on a Sunday afternoon when you're at home having a beer and saying, hey, Lou, I got a movie for you. You want to come in and be in the movie or audition? Um, anyway, I know our fans are dying to find out, and I am as well, too. So, again, thank you for being a part of our show. So there's Mark's question. How does Rob Zombie get a hold of you to audition? Or do you even audition? Well, first of all, I feel underdressed now that I'm not wearing a tie <laughs> and, a, and a nice button up like Marco. So thank you for being a gentleman, Marco. I, I recognize that and I acknowledge you. Um, Rob Zombie is, uh, is a friend. Uh, he's become a, a, a friend, a good friend. And so at this stage in our friendship and our working relationship, he literally does call up and say, hey, I've got a project. I wrote this thing for you. or I've got a, a role for you in mind. Um, 
I'd love for you to do this. Let me know if you're free. Uh, or, and on my end of things, it's like, oh, Rob's calling. Hello. And yes, uh, he just, yes, I'll do it. But that's not how it started. It started through the audition process uh, for The Devil's Rejects. Mm. And, uh, Great and casting, movie. Great movie. Yeah, I think one of the one of the classics in the horror genre. Absolutely. Right? It just turned 15 years old. Wow. We're all so proud of it, for sure. Wow. In one more year, it'll be able to drive. <laughs> um, so, I was asked by the casting director who had known me, Monica Mickelson, and she said, uh, would you come in and read for this role for this Rob Zombie? And I vaguely knew that Rob was a musician, like a heavy metal musician. Mm -hmm. I was a little confused. Mm -hmm. he, wait, he, the rock star is directing a movie? Okay. And then I read the script and I was really confused because I hadn't up to that point is really engaged in the horror genre. I'd been a horror fan as a kid, but like hammer horror films, the, you know, monster movies, gotcha, Frank, gotcha. Werewolf, Dracula. I wasn't yeah. as, and I'd seen, you know, Dawn of the Dead, but I wasn't dug in like a lot of, of your audience. So I read the first page, and we've got this giant dragging a naked girl through the woods, and I was like, whoa, wow, what? And uh, so I went in and auditioned, and I got a call from Monica and said, Rob really liked your read, and he's really considering you. And by the way, in that audition room, uh, Jeremy Davies, who I really respect his work, I really like him, mm -hmm. and Steve Zahn were in there as well, also auditioning for the role of Adam Banjo. So. And I had known their work, and I was like, wow, this is this is incredible. Those two guys are great. But then I got a little nervous because it started to look like it was going to happen. And again, I I, I wasn't so sure. And I, I, uh, I called a friend of mine, Walton Goggins, who was in the first movie, House of a Thousand Corpses. Yeah. And Walton uh, and I are friends, and I said, I'm not sure about this uh, devil worshiper, Rob Zombie, you know, I, I'm a good Christian boy from the South, what's gonna, you know, and Walton laughed at me, and he said, oh, come on, this guy's great, he's an ar artist, and he is uh, gonna be a friend for life, and you're gonna have a great uh, creative experience, and truer words are never spoke, and, and up to this point, it's been a great relationship with Rob. Uh, I don't audition necessarily for him as much, though I would if he said, hey, I, I'd like to see you read for this part. I would, would do it for sure. But he pretty much calls to ask me, not just me, but most of your audience who are uh, fans of his recognize a lot of his ensemble. Oh, yeah. And um, he goes to use those people. You know what he does, Viz, is he understands that he can count on his a group of core core players and that allows him it frees him up to experience new players that he hasn't worked with yeah. like when yeah. he was starting to work with Malcolm McDowell mm -hmm. of course Malcolm's great but he'd never worked with him and he wanted to have the time to to be available for Malcolm and I know that with Ken Foray and Luke Temple and and Bill Mosley and Sid Haig God rest his soul mm -hmm. I, I don't have to worry about doing a lot with them and I can focus on new guys and he switches that over wisely as well you know he turns it over a little bit with with some new new blood and I think that's just really smart as a filmmaker so that's awesome. I adore Rob and his storytelling for sure and I gotta I've add I, Rob, I've always wanted Rob sorry to interrupt no, his, okay. um, to direct an episode of The Walking Dead oh, that would be amazing Right? That would be amazing. And uh, I was just like you when it came to Rob Zombie. I knew him. I heard of him as a musician. And then the next thing I know, I hear his name being mentioned in movie credits. And I'm like, when did that happen? Uh, but I was just like you. Uh, you know, yeah. knew him as a musician. Next thing I know, he's in the movies. Since we're on the topic of directors, uh, you got to work with also Greg Nicotero on The Walking Dead. He directed, I believe it was uh, season three, episode five, uh, right. in which you were in. So let's take Greg Nicotero's directing style versus Rob Zombie. Now, we've had previous guests on this show who have worked with different Walking Dead directors, and they have said that uh, Greg Nicotero's style of directing in his episodes are more gorier than other Walking Dead directors. Now, if you put the style of directing up Zombie versus Nicotero, what is similar and what is completely different between the two? 
a lot of similarities. Uh, they, they, uh, there's a lot of cross pollination there in, in that they've actually worked together and, and consulted with each other, particularly Rob on um, special effects makeup, uh, special effects in camera use. I know that Rob has called Greg for consultation on certain um, s certain effects. So they have a mutual respect, absolutely. They also have a mutual respect for the process of acting. Mm. And I noticed with both Rob and Greg, they, they were very uh, aware and conscious of being good stewards to the actors and very uh, uh, methodically going into a scene and not bulldozing through it, listening to what everyone's saying, watching, making sure that the sense and the feel and the nuance of the scene that the performers were engaged in wasn't getting stepped on by, by camera moves or, or, or wardrobe or special effects. So they have a real healthy um, respect for the process. I think respect sums up the two of them. They're both uh, from a school of having earned their stripes. Not everybody is, but these two in particular have, have been from the way back, you know. Yeah. And, and they're fans of the genre, the horror genre, before, before they're, they're filmmakers. Yeah. You know, they were 12-year-old kids, too. And that's when they were at the height of their fever for the, the horror genre. So they've never lost that. They, they, they entirely respect that. Um, and, and that shows up on the day's work. Uh, I think that Greg, his attention to detail is really beyond what a lot of the other directors bring in because Greg is so involved with the walkers. He's so involved with the blood. He's so involved with the dirt that's on Daryl's face. Yeah. He's so involved with the hair. I mean, really hands on. And he's been hands on. He spent a lot of that time in that makeup trailer building all of these things. So he's a great director because he's always learning. He comes in very open to learning and, and experiencing the scene for what it is. He also brings a lot of, uh, detail-oriented preparation, as does Rob. So Rob actually really knows what he wants when he comes on to set and when he comes in to do a scene. And then he'll watch to see if it's getting close to meeting what he wants. And if it is, then he'll go with it. But if it's not, he'll scrap it and, yeah. and adjust really quickly. So he's great. Um, great story about Greg. So we had worked together on various projects, one being the uh, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre mm -hmm. beginning, beginning when I did. Yeah. Um, we've been knowing a long time. So the episode that he directed in season three was one of his first directing in The Walking Dead. He had been an executive producer in charge of special effects up to that point. Mm -hmm. And he had directed a whole series of shorts that are fantastic. I believe they're called Cold Storage. Mm -hmm. And that showed his chops. Well, through the process, and I'm sure there's no spoilers here dating back to season three, no, but I, no. when I meet my demise, the decision hadn't been made just yet, Viz, and the word came down in the 11th hour, because Andrew Lincoln was going to bat for me, and, and um, they just weren't sure, but they decided it was going to be Axel. It was too late for Greg Nicotero to make a life cast, in other words, a, a dummy, and he and I kind of share the same sort of facial structure. And he had done a lot of, of uh, body casts of himself. So he used himself and made him look like Axel, his, wow. his own. And so that's actually Greg Nicotero getting shot up as Carol's, um, you know, her, yeah, her yeah. Bag in in uh, when the governor and the war shows up, all the shot. Not the shot in the head was totally me, but then down on the ground. Um, when Carol uses uh, Axel as a body shield. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Oh wow! So Greg and I we share that. So I'm I'm proud of that. And then of course he's gone on to direct amazing episodes. Oh yeah. Uh, on The Walking Dead, and uh, he's he's a force, and I I think 
uh, Rob's a force as well. And the two of them get on really great. Yeah, and one of the, since you just mentioned that, that leads me to one of the questions our viewer has. Uh, Zachary on Instagram, he had a specific question about Axel's death scene. Um, I guess you answered the question. Did they use uh, that cast? Was it like a full dummy that got shot? Or did they put a capsule uh, something under the skin to make it pop and look like it was a gunshot on your face, or was it Greg Nicotero's, or was it a mannequin? That's great. Good question, Zachary. Appreciate that. Well, we used the movie Magic. Uh, at that time, um, we were doing a lot of in-camera effects. Uh, that particular shot was choreographed. It was a CGI, mm -hmm. the actual hit on the head in the temple. Mm -hmm. And so we had to choreograph that as to uh, when I got hit with that high powered rifle, was I gonna drop like a sack of potatoes? Was I gonna get knocked off, off my feet for several feet back? Uh, we decided that the bullet would pierce the skull and I would drop or at least fall in. And my decision was to fall into Carol's arms. So at that point, she's dealing with blood on her hands, mine and Axel, this guy that she was having a great conversation with. So we had to really choreograph how I was going to jerk and get turned mm -hmm. and just hold it for a, enough of a millisecond that they could put the CGI in for the blood hit. And then I go down onto Carol. And then by the time she's on, a gr on the ground, the dummy's brought in. Mm -hmm. And she's dealing with that. I mean, I was a dummy for a little bit, but most of the war, most of the shots, uh, it was the real dummy. Uh -huh. who was really good at being a dead dummy, better than me. <laughs> All right, let's go to another video question. This is from Janie Joe from Canada on Instagram. So let me go ahead nice. and bring that out. Uh, hey, Lou, good evening. Oh, this is that does one. Hey, this one. Um, I'm Janie from Canada. And I want to know, would you have wanted to change the way you die in The Walking Dead? So, uh, there you go. Would you have wanted a different death on The Walking Dead than the one you got? Uh, no, absolutely no. Uh, as a matter of fact, as I said, it was, uh, it was a late call on how that was going to go. Um, I mean, they had reached out three weeks in advance, but, but it was all in, it's a possibility. Then it moved to a probability, but we're still debating. So one of the things they asked me, would you like, when they made the decision, would you like to come into the writer's room maybe and discuss it with our writers? And I was like, no, they do great. Don't no. but I would love for the death to be a gut punch and rather shocking, which I'm really proud to say it I was. think it was. It was, absolutely. And so I, I love the fact that hopefully it wasn't indicated. You didn't see it coming. No. I worked really hard with um, Carol, with uh, Melissa McBride, not to telegraph it too much, and that it shocked people for sure. And then ultimately, I didn't want to reanimate Viz. I didn't want to be a walker and go through Greg Nicotero's makeup for six hours and have to be put down uh, like Merle um, <laughs> so that uh, Chandler could come out and, and steal my mustache, Carl, <laughs> uh, and, and impress Beth. So, no, uh, Jamie, good question. But, no, I, I actually wouldn't want to change my death in any way. I would have liked to have prolonged it yeah. for a season. Do. if you're asking that for sure yeah i'd like to have hung around a little bit longer so like, that brings me actually to uh my next question okay when you got given the part of axel was your lifespan on the show predetermined and shared with you uh the character of axel or oh. did it happen li late yeah it totally happens late in fact when you come on the show you're made you're so welcomed uh, by the entire production and not just the producers of the writers, but, but, but also the cast. And you're, you're made to feel as if you're going to be on the show for, for the long haul. I mean, I literally thought I was going to be on the show for seven years. Mm. That would have been awesome. <laughs> yeah. That, that would so have been start, awesome. But you're made to feel that way. You're made definitely to feel part of the family, uh, which is a, a a big reason I think the show does so well is because it's so collaborative and everyone's pulling on the same side of the rope. Absolutely. Um, 
So, no, I didn't know until late in the game. Now, that being said, I understood in the graphic novels that Axel did meet his demise in the war uh, with the governor mm -hmm. at the prison. I just didn't didn't know what the timing of that was going to be. We were, and and we did get painted into a little bit of a corner at the time. The governor was going to show up, and he needed to draw first blood, or he'd be impotent. Mm -hmm. You know, he needed to have some collateral damage, and so it was really a decision as to who, who at that point. And the the problem a problem was is that they'd found these prisoners, and sequentially each one of us went down there was never a prisoner to carry on through the prison and the idea was to at least have one because they were, had always spoke about biz that they wanted to do a standalone episode of the riot in the prison like attica when when the uh, epidemic broke out that is, I mean, it's funny how your answers lead me to questions that I have down the list. And oh, good. Because I'm just going to jump to this next question because your answer sort of hinted to this. If you got a call tomorrow uh, saying that, you know, we're getting six extra episodes in 2021, right? Whether they yeah. do it in single episodes for six different characters or they do the whole six episodes on one character and they say, we want to do a backstory on Axel, would you even hesitate and think about it or would you say, I'm in? No, I would so, I would so say I'm in. And again, it's, it's part of being in the family. I mean, you know this, you're, you're a huge part of the show, mm -hmm. as is the audience. And that's... That's something that I think we've all built, not just the production, but, but the audience. We don't refer on set to, to the fans. We refer to you as the audience because you're part of the show. So uh, there's a responsibility that you have to family, and that is to do and to show up and to be part of. And so it feels like that. Oh, it would be great. Don't get me wrong. It would be a nice, um, a nice bit of work, but it's also... You know, I'm part of the family, so yeah. if I'm called, I'm gonna I'm gonna show up. So that's great. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Just because your character dies on The Walking Dead, we have seen time and time again, uh, they remain. Oh, I think we lost them again. Hold on. Sorry, guys, we keep losing the connection. Let's get him back. Well, I apologize, guys. His internet may have went out or something. Let's see if we can get him back here. Let me try again. But how many of you guys knew that, that Lou Temple actually read for the part of Merle? Let's try it again. Oh, that sucks. It looks like his internet might have went down. Uh, I'll keep trying here. That really stinks. Well, his internet, we'll try again in a minute, but I'm sorry about that, guys. It looks like his internet uh, cut out on him. Uh, hopefully, we'll get him back here very shortly. But what blew me away is the fact that uh, when he was originally in, they wanted him to read for the part of Merle and even read for an unnamed character who we know now to be Daryl, Merle's brother. Uh, I'm just going to keep trying to get him back on the line here. No, no, I do apologize for this, guys. Uh, 
I do. I have been getting your guys' questions. Uh, they've been being messaged to me. Oh, here we go. Lou? Hey, yes. we got no. you back. Okay. I'm, I'm so sorry. No, no, it it's be. fine. It's fine. Please, please don't apologize. Oh, we just lost him again. Wow. Uh, that stinks. Oh, let's try it again. All right. You there? There we go. Okay. I'm so sorry. No. It must be the walk dead producers not wanting me to talk about the idea <laughs> that they're going to put me in one of these movies yeah. that they're doing with, uh, with Rick Grimes and Andrew Lincoln. Yep. And I just want to tell our Instagram audience, because we did get cut off, we're going to run a little bit over uh, the one hour and Instagram is going to cut us off. So, guys, if you want to continue the um, watching our conversation with Lou, please go on over to YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter. Because we are going to go past the hour tonight. And Instagram is going to cut us off at the one hour mark. But we're on on three other platforms. So, we want to get the full hour in with Lou. So, please head on over to YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter so you guys can see the full show. Okay? So let's see where we left off. Um, I, I was asking, I was going to find the, uh, the question that led into your last answer and uh, just refresh my mind. We were talking about, um, whatchamacallit, the... Uh, uh, if you had asked if I, would, uh, if I would come back and do... Uh, the Walking you know, Dead. Well, the answer is unequivocally yes. yes. Just Not just because it would be great work and great visibility but because we're all part of the family and we we pitch in if they ask for sure exactly like and i was saying that we've heard this we've had michael cudlitz on this show and he's he's, he's still part of the family and directing episodes yeah he's directing yeah and he's also directing uh uh from the new uh the new show that's world beyond that hasn't even premiered yet he told us yeah. he he directed at least two or three of uh, those episodes so let's get to another video question lou okay okay that's this is from cat from australia hi lou oh. from australia. okay let me bring up uh guys let me bring up the screen share and i keep forgetting that every time we get disconnected i have to reshare the screen so let me go ahead and do that so lou can see exactly the sh okay do you have the screen now lou I do. Okay, Thank you. So let's go to Kat's question from Australia. Hi, Lou. I'm Kat from Australia. Thank you for being here. My question for you today is, had your character Axel not met his demise on the series when he did, how would you have liked to see him develop on the series? And would you have had a different way in which he did exit the show? Is, is there something else that you have had in mind if you had the choice? Thank you. So basically, Kat is uh, asking, uh, how would you have seen Axel's character progression if he did not get killed off in season three? And you've already answered the question about you being satisfied with his demise. So let's say that demise did not happen. And like you said it yourself, you wanted, you, you know, we all agree that uh, at least one of the prisoners should have survived and it was really it's between you and oscar you know as far as yeah. which of the two prisoners should go on so let's say axel is the one that went on how would you see his character unfolding when the prison fell uh terminus and let's say it did last seven more years wow that would take us all the way into the hilltop and uh the whisperers and everything oh my yeah, that'd be a lot. Well, I think fundamentally Axel would be somebody that would be in support of uh, the survivors, Rick, Rick Grimes' group, and always trying to help out, uh, especially when Herschel was around. God rest Scott Wilson's soul as yes, well. Yes, a big loss. Oh, we lost uh, Axel. Uh, we lost uh, Lou again. <laughs> Uh, 
Are you there? Yes, yes. It reconnected. Good. Okay, it reconnected. Okay, okay we're good. Sure, that was short. Yeah. Uh, you know, I would see him being very helpful. Uh, definitely a friend to Carol. Although, w which way that Carol went into the sort of um, uh, the, you know, re introspective, reclusive, uh, you know, eye for an eye person? Maybe not. Maybe not so much uh, with. Um, with that, my look at the flowers. Carol yeah. may not yeah. be the the date that Axel's looking for. Yeah. Um, so I think he's more of a peacemaker in general, but he wouldn't be afraid to stand up uh, for a fight. I don't think that he would have liked the setting with Negan. I think he would have suggested we've got to, you know, we've got to overcome the suppression, the oppression of, of Negan, mm -hmm. and. Um, and the whispers, you know, I think they're entirely something. They're scary. Yes, <laughs> really very, very afraid of. But I think in general, Axel would be helpful. Um, that being said, there was conversation during the course of my time there that we may, we may avail some secrets about Axel. We don't really know for sure, but the possibility that he could be something that's not on the label something that we're not seeing um and, and actually i'm gonna i'm gonna get to my next question because i know exactly where you're going and okay. that brings me exactly to my next question now i've recounted to our audience uh several times that uh you've mentioned in a prior interview that the original story was for axel or at least one of the stories being played around with in regards to axel's character was for him to be a serial killer and yeah. uh, he was going to take Beth into the woods and actually murder her. And the way we read the, uh, the, the interview that you did, uh, I believe you described it. That idea was nixed because it was too dark. And uh, my question, well, first of all, I'd, I'll, I'll let you address that. And then I have a second part to the question. But I'll let you address the whole serial killer aspect first. Well... The idea was that we wanted to reserve the opportunity to have a dark closet for Axel so that it could always be pulled out. So there was there was a challenge for me because we do want him to be like likable and very colloquial. And so um, that's always the presentation, kind of the guy that wears his heart on his sleeve. But then to keep him rather buttoned up, you'll notice that I never really unbuttoned mm -hmm. my prison. Uh, uniform and was always, uh, you know, told that, you know, at one point I was in for drugs and another time armed robbery. Um, you know, what's what's the truth? Uh, uh, just reserving the opportunity to to break out some fangs if they were the case, and those fangs may have, in well, in fact, been an opportunity to kidnap one uh, one of the surviving gang, which which would be typically Beth mm -hmm. at that stage um, and take her out into the woods and then have this, you know, Rick in the group fought chasing me for that. And, you know, the idea might be that a mercy killing for something, you know, to stop the apocalypse. Um, none of that was developed or fortified because we ran out of time. All of a sudden the governor was there, the war was going to happen and it was going to be done. So we never, we never got to execute any of that, obviously. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I, I liked the idea that we had the options um, for anyone that was watching Axel. You know, I was really trying to in, elicit trust in him, not just amongst, uh, you know, amongst the players, but with the audience as well. Mm -hmm. So. Hoping I was able to nail that. And then if we spun it again on them, I think it would be a big reveal exactly. for sure. So, yeah. I mean, in regards to Beth's character, in season three, uh, which you were in, did it, did it come across to you that just they didn't know what to do with her character at that point? I think they had an idea. And I think there was so much going on uh, at the time because... You have to remember up to that point from season two, and I don't have to remind you of mm -hmm. this, that it had been it had been very insular at Herschel's farm, and they weren't exposing 
many new people. There wasn't much new blood per se. Yeah. Uh, and then we broke into the prison with the five of us, which was entirely, oh, yay, new people, and went right from there to Woodbury, a whole town. Yeah. Uh, and so the writers were really having to, you, you know, ramp up to start different storylines because up to that point it had all been at Herschel's farm. And so I think they did know what they wanted to do with Beth. They just hadn't fortified the chance to do it yet. And so I think we saw down the road, um, we started to see that, that they were, they were going to utilize Beth more, uh, than, than more what they were able to do at that time. And the other thing was you'll remember in season three was sort of Andrew Lincoln's Rick Grimes King Lear. Mm -hmm. You know, he was, he was under the, uh, the spell of, of he had lost Lori mm -hmm. and then he was seeing her in dreams. Oh, he lost it. He lost it. Yeah. He totally lost it. Mm -hmm. And the, and so there was a lot going on and they were really focused on that. That was, I call that all roads let lead to the sheriff yeah. and that whole season to me. And, and up to that point, all the seasons led to Rick Grimes. And then they started mm -hmm. opening up to the play point of we've got, several characters that we're going to build storylines with okay great so uh basically they did the whole bath murder scene it wasn't nick's because it was too dark i don't think so i don't think they're look you know what they what they, they yeah, be, yeah what they've they done the and what where they've been i mean they they're not afraid to step in those shadows no okay um so, and I think they're, you know, they know what they're doing. They're very good at keeping the integrity of the story on the show. And so I think what, what they plan is, is not by accident. No. I know it's not, yeah. you know, those they're, it's very, it's very well sculpted and built. Absolutely. Okay. We have another question. This is from Cassandra on YouTube. Uh, would like to hear your perspective on Axel's relationship with Carol, played by Melissa yeah. McBride. Where was it going? Uh, she was really sad to see you go so soon. So what could have developed between uh, Axel and Carol? Uh, Cassandra, good question. I'm glad you asked. You know, there was an entire episode that Axel and Carol were missing. And uh, Daryl gives a it was actually daryl that gives the insight in a uh, a group talk and says hey where's axel oh i think he's with carol they're working in the generator room <laughs> wink wink yeah um so so i think that axel and carol had a a great friendship at that point we we remember that carol was was pretty much to herself she she had been missing for a long you know several episodes of the season mm -hmm. we thought she uh, she'd met her demise uh, we were all worried about her or the survivors were for sure yeah. and and so when she was recovered rediscovered um, she was rather sullen and to herself and I felt like Axel was somebody that she felt comfortable with and could open up to uh, certainly we started off on the wrong foot because I accused her of having yeah short hair. yeah I remember yeah and, and having uh, lesbian tendencies, yep. which uh, Carol denied. Uh, let's see if we can... Uh, Hold on. Melissa McBride did such a great job uh, in her... And she at least felt comfortable enough to open up with Axel, and I think um, over the course of time we could have explored that yeah uh maybe similar to some of the other um maybe not so much like ezekiel but maybe more like the tobin relationship mm -hmm. we could have you know went down that road a little bit um axel's a talker yeah he talks a lot he's a lot like lou and so oh and cares seems to be a good listener yeah. <laughs> so i think they would have uh, uh, you're, you're cutting in and out, Lou. Can you hear me? Uh, I do hear you. Okay, yeah. okay. We got you back. You... We got you back. Uh, 
Now, Yay. in regards to uh, another viewer of ours, Hard Productions, uh, what is uh, what's it like to work with Melissa McBride as a colleague uh, on the set? Uh, it's 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 really fantastic. It's very rewarding. She is uh, uh, she's very available as an actress. She's uh, she's she's very calm. Uh, I find her to be. Uh, really prepared and in the moment and very giving as an actor and um, she makes every scene that she has there's a kind of a wry smile to to her work um, even I think she's had the toughest scene ever in The Walking Dead which is look at the flowers it's for Lizzie, me is, yes. yeah it's the most difficult scene they've done I mean her, that and the Negan thing for sure um, but eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Um, but I think she does it with a real grace and, um, and a strength and w the, the arc that she's built this character from, from being a battered wife, uh, a victim to being the leader, yeah. the bad leader of the show, uh, is amazing. And it's, it's one of the gratifying things to watch uh with the walking dead so it's just a you know it's a real pleasure to work with her and again her reactions i think are what make everything her her gentle smile yeah. that she receives and then she can also w with her eyes she can set a stare that that tells you she means business yeah absolutely and you know we all remember uh, at the end of season two, Carol was not the badass that we know, you know, uh, in season Fine. 10. It wasn't until your season, season three, is when she really started to go through a transformation. So as fans, we got to really ask ourselves if Axel stuck around and let's say a relationship did develop between Carol and Axel, how would that have impacted carol's character arc uh because we know she has probably had one of the worst luck of any characters on the show in regards to children love, love and yeah. everything uh yeah. so it's, it's just one of those questions that you really got to ask yourself because axel did really bring uh a sort of comic relief to the uh to the show uh right. everything else was so serious with the governor who is, in my opinion, uh, to this day, the most evil villain we've had. More evil than Negan. Uh, yeah. At least we know Negan actually does have a soul. Uh, uh, David Morrissey, who did a brilliant job playing the governor. Uh, you know, the governor was just a pure psychopath. And he was. Very complicated. I thought very, very interesting. Uh, you know, getting back to your question, I think that Axel might have softened Carol's heart up a little bit, a heart that had been damaged, a heart that she was protecting. I think that that Carol may have may have not been so prone to, to go out on the riskier, hard edge of of life that she took on. Yeah. Maybe maybe a little softness, a little a little compassion, a little uh, intimacy might have served her um, in that realm, but then all the other stuff might have not come about either. The leader, yeah, uh, the person you can count on that she's come to be, she's the one we look to to save our ass when we're in trouble. And she, so and she, maybe maybe that doesn't happen. Exactly, and she's done it so many times. Uh, right, save their ass and. Like I said, we've seen her take such a character arc to where in this current season, her actions are actually putting people in jeopardy because she's just out for blood and revenge uh, uh, for Alpha. Uh, so let's look, I mean, from the way, you know, you are still a huge fan of the show, it seems like. Yeah, um, yeah. No doubt, yeah. I mean, I mean that is just fabulous. Uh, so Amelia Rose from Instagram her question is, in general, with the cast of The Walking Dead, uh, Andrew Lincoln, Norman Reedus, what was the atmosphere like behind the scenes with all of them? Oh, that's a good question, Amelia, as well. Um, 
you know, it's as I said, it's it's a lot of work. Uh, we're exposed to the elements. We're outside. Uh, it's it's very hot in Atlanta, Georgia. There's tons of bugs. There's uh, dehydration. Um, uh, there's all manner of obstacles. It's a challenge every day to film, and then the work itself is a challenge. The the themes, uh, the storylines, the the relationships, the walkers, it's all difficult. So it's a day's work, make no mistake. But to go to work with professionals, and Andrew Lincoln, when I was there, was the Tom Brady of our set. Wow. And so he was the guy that delivered the mail. He carried the ball. And nobody worked harder than Andrew, a tireless worker, tried everything. He must get it right. He wouldn't accept, okay, that'll work. He must get it right. Um, he set the example. He set the bar for all of us. And that bar has been passed down through every generation on The Walking Dead. It was there when I got there. It was given to me. I passed it along when I left. Mm -hmm. I know to this day, and speaking to new cast members, it continues to be passed down what it takes to make this show as good as it is. And so it was great. You know, there's such a camaraderie amongst the cast and the crew. There's no hierarchy. It's not cast and crew. It's cast and crew. And everybody eats lunch together. Everybody sits at the same table. There's there's no cool kids table. Um, everybody respects everyone. Everybody uh, enjoys everyone. We we social together when we're we're not working. So uh, you know, again, this is all attributable to why it works. Um, and those two in particular, Andrew and Norman, uh, you know, Andrew's got a lot of work. And he, as I said, he's carrying the ball. And Norman has a lot of work when he does. And when he doesn't, he can sit back and be the cool guy and have a lot of fun. And and so he would like to play jokes on Andrew Lincoln. And, and he would get us to, to chime in on those jokes. Sometimes we'd walk in on set with uh, sombreros, you know, in the middle of a scene. Or we'd switch, uh, you know. I would be wearing Norman's costume and he'd be wearing mine or, yeah. uh, you know, we do different hijinks and, and, and jokes. And that being said, Andrew might smirk or, or he chuckle a little bit, but then he'd be right back to, Hey, we got to get this done. He was, he, he, he knew how to keep, keep the game, keep the line moving. Yeah. And, uh, but it was a, a real pleasure. I've not experienced that about the focus of the work. It was uh, it was really fantastic. Yeah, and you're not the first one to say that that we've had on this show. Uh, when you were there, uh, is it true that uh, Andy never uh, broke into his English accent throughout the shooting that day? Is, yeah, that's true. He he stayed in character. He stayed in his southern accent because he had worked so hard. To, to hold on to it and to maintain it and and uh, you know it's not his natural accent no. we all know now that he's british yeah. and he has a quite a quite posh proper british accent so for him to go into a real rural rustic georgian accent in this you know the deep south um that took a lot of work and that took a lot of work in his uh, offset time so he would work all on his days off on new dialogue with a with a dialect coach from Los Angeles and on some occasions he would fly to Los Angeles work with the dialect coach fly back to Georgia just in time to start the new episode so that's what I mean about tireless work so yeah he he wouldn't break that accent uh, just to be able to maintain it oh and it's amazing from what you just said it's not like something he got when he started the show and then he just maintained it sounds from what you're saying he constantly worked to keep getting better at it and he did. yeah he did. that's amazing. because you know when we when we go through situations when they're measured like this conversation and we're in a very relaxed voice in a relaxed atmosphere and we we were able to control it we can rehearse that and be pretty much on point but when emotions escalate when we start to yell and we start to get anxious and we have to run and physicalize that's when 
it starts to slip, mm -hmm. that's when he might fall back. And so that was where the work was because we were always running, we were always chasing, we were always the walkers are there, yeah. the governors are there, um, you know, Merle, uh, where's Daryl? Is that Lori? I mean, my gosh, the poor guy had a lot on his plate and including speaking Southern. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, he did, he did a fantastic job. And the more we hear as fans, the amount of effort and work he, uh, Andy puts into, uh, his craft, the, uh, the more we respect he gains, uh, Aiden from YouTube has, uh, a question. If, uh, if, Axel was to give uh, season 10 Carol any piece of advice, what would it be? Axel's character oh, to Carol. That's a great question, Aiden. Well thought, well spoke, sir, on YouTube. Uh, Axel would definitely, definitely remind Carol of hope. Uh, with hope comes tomorrow. Mm. And with hope uh, comes humanity. And if you lose hope, and you dismiss uh, the compassion for the human existence, um, there's, there's tomorrow's not going to come. No. So she's got to get back into a better place. She's lost her way. Yeah. And, and, and she needs, she, she, she needs for hope to show up in some form or fashion in, in someone, something, some moment to relieve her of of the burden that she's carrying and uh, and i suspect if i know the show i suspect it will, will show up in the most unrecognizable uh unapologetic way and i think it'll be great so i'm excited Me too. i'm an audience I'm an audience member, remember, yeah. so I'm just like you. I'm waiting for it. Okay. Great questioning. Uh, in the final few moments that we have, I uh, just have some very quick, uh, interesting questions for you. Which role are you most proud of that you played? Oh, that's, that's a nice question. Um, independent film would be Cal, uh, the manager of the diner in the movie Waitress. Okay. I adore that role, and I adore that movie. Uh, studio film would be Ned Oldham on Unstoppable. Mm -hmm. um, Denzel Washington, a big action yeah. adventure movie made by Tony Scott with uh, Captain Kirk, Chris Pine. <laughs> and on television, it would be Axel for sure. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So I could I could put all three of those guys. Uh, all three of them had mustaches. Okay. Next question. What is your most embarrassing moment you've ever had on a set? Oh. One time I was being levitated into a UFO in a spacecraft, which meant that I was on a bungee uh, cord being, and I was uh, doing all the movement of being lifted, levitated, uh -huh. and um, it was after lunch, and, and, and I got sick. I lost my lunch oh, now, in, front of, in front of the whole crew. That was embarrassing. All right, last question, and then we're out of time. Is there a story that you've been itching to tell your whole career about something that's happened on set that nobody's ever asked you about or you've never had a chance to reveal before hmm. and just seems like I, seems like i'm the kind of guy that's told everything <laughs> i don't have i don't think i have any secrets um like on the walking dead uh what is the one little just thing that happened on a particular day that you know might have been minor that you know it would be just fascinating for us to hear i think it was really interesting when vincent ward and i oscar oscar yeah uh, we had filmed and we knew the show but we didn't really we hadn't seen this character yet and we were we were called in one day we weren't on the schedule, but we were called in to do this scene, and it was it was it was in the courtyard of the prison. And all of a sudden, this little boy walks out, and Rick's. It, and so we just were put in the scene. We weren't sure, and Rick's. He's beside himself, and this little boy has a, a baby in one arm and a gun in the other. <laughs> and we're like, and we're like, what the hell is going on? Who, there's a kid with a baby and a gun. Oh my god! And a, 
and he's and it was of course it was Chandler and he just shot Lori uh -huh. and um, and he had Judith in his arm and we hadn't been privy to that was going to happen they had shot it out of sequence so it was a little bit early uh -huh. and we had never we had never met they had always kept uh, Chandler away from us prisoners we had never met um, Chandler Riggs playing Carl that's a good point I you know had, yeah that's a great yeah. point I never really and so, yeah because they didn't want to expose him uh, and so they always kept him away so we never met we ne I'd never met Chandler I knew there was a boy playing this guy but I, I was like I don't know where he is you know and all of a sudden there he was and in the most you know wearing his dad's hat and you got to keep in mind he was he was like nine or ten then. Um, he's a full-ass grown man now. That's super cool. But back then he was a little boy. I'm not even kidding. With a baby yeah. and a big gun. And um, so, so as painful as that moment was for everybody, Vincent and I were like in shock that <laughs> this guy was in front of us. That's awesome. Uh, that's which awesome. Was really that was really fun. And you know, uh, until you just mentioned it, it never really occurred to me that if we look back in the first half of season three, you're right. There were no scenes with Chandler Riggs and any one of the prisoners. Uh, you know. Yeah, we, we, we hadn't been exposed. And then, of course, afterwards, uh, you know, uh, we, we, Vincent and I, Oscar and I earned the trust and, and, uh, and we were good with that. Um, there were so many other little things that, uh, you know, there was a scene, interestingly, that we did, uh, we were in, we were in execution with Rick, uh, and, and Daryl and, and T-Dog, Irony and, and, uh, Norman and, and Andy had Oscar and us down on our knees and I was begging for my life. Yeah. And, um, and Oscar was too in the script and it just didn't sound right. It didn't sound. And, um, somehow I went to Vince and I said, is this right? He goes, I don't know. I said, what's missing? He goes, I don't know that I would beg for my life. A white guy would, but black guys don't typically because nobody listens. This is what we're going through right now. Yeah, yeah. And we brought that to the attention of the writers, and they were cool enough to fix that. Wow. Uh, and they adjusted it so it plays as it does. Uh, Stop talking, man. Or, or Oscar's great speech where he said, man, I've never begged for my life. I ain't about to start now. You do what you have to do. And... Um, which gives Oscar a lot of power. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think that was something. And again, credit to the production, the writers and producers for being available to listen and adjust. That's, and that happens happens all the time. And again, yeah. that's why the show's honest and right. Exactly. And you're not the first one to tell that kind of similar story. Now, one last question, and then we'll let you go, Lou. Uh, this comes from Fernando on YouTube. Uh, Lou, he says, "Do you think that Axel?" would have uh, a chance to survive in the war against the Whisperers and Negan if uh, if Axel would have survived the prison? Uh, I guess it's all relative. I think Axel, Axel could have survived a day. So if, if surviving a day is, is surviving, yes. Uh, I uh, you know, he... he he, Axel would be compassionate to, to humans, and I don't think he looks forward to human suffering. So he would try to protect, and that would probably put him in harm's way. So the chances of his long-term survival um, may not be as good as um, somebody who's cold-hearted. Uh, yeah. Somebody that's, uh, you know, maybe someone that's looking out for himself. Exactly. I think Axel put himself in harm's way nobly um to try to make peace like hey we don't have to do this negan please you know yeah. let's we got enough let's try to get along think about what we're doing here which probably would have got a full mouthful of lucille oh yeah definitely definitely well lou uh thank you so much for being on our oh, show it's my pleasure. 
and I apologize for the glitches, the in and out. No, Those weren't. no problem. No problem. Uh, we are honored to have had you on our show. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. Uh, thank you to all our viewers. Thank you to Lou Temple for sharing all these experiences with us. Uh, it's been an amazing hour plus and Instagram never cut us off. Instagram, oh, I thought it's, there was an hour limit. I guess it might've changed the rules. We're an hour, 10 minutes in and they have not cut us off. So thank you so much. That's tributable to you, Biz. That's attributable to you. <laughs> thank you so much, Lou. Thank you so much to our viewers. Guys, it's been awesome. Until tomorrow night, guys, always stay walking.